With Akagi and Kaga both in service by 1928, expectations for the performance of the two ships was high, as their designs were the culmination of the most recent data on carrier development. Unfortunately for these two ships, the design path the Japanese took was highly flawed, and they would not recognize it until both ships were completed, and this meant within the next decade, both would be fully reconstructed, and even following reconstruction, many design issues lingered around, mainly related to their initial design. Obviously, the first issue the Japanese ran into with these two ships was their triple flight deck system. As aircraft development continued, the planes got larger and more powerful, and this meant that aircraft were unable to take off from the lower and middle flight deck as time carried on, and the middle flight deck for the entire career was largely restricted to fighter aircraft as dive bombers and torpedo bombers were too heavy to take off from this flight deck, and they could hardly fit between the two 20-centimeter turrets flanking either side of the flight deck. Rather than helping aircraft operations, the triple flight deck hindered it. Speaking of the 20-centimeter guns, these two were eventually recognized as a design issue. At the time the ships entered service, the turrets were considered the main culprit, as they had restricted the width of the flight deck, and of course, this meant that only fighters could fit between them reliably, but by 1934, the Japanese came to recognize that mounting cruiser-sized guns on an aircraft carrier was a redundant idea, as if the ship could shoot at hostile vessels, and this meant that they were within aircraft attack range for several hundred miles, so the aircraft carrier should never be expected to shoot at another vessel with one of its guns. The Japanese would not come to recognize that carriers should not mount cruiser guns until the final design of Soryu was approved in 1934. Of course, the Swiss design G9. The next category that impacted the ships was its aviation facilities, and this was broken down into multiple issues. The first one being the irregularity of the hangar walls. Many spots of the hangar walls would jut into the ship, while various other locations would jut out. This meant that the storage of aviation was irregular, and there was not a consistent number of aircraft that could be carried. The ships were so large, yet they carried a comparable amount of aircraft to vessels half their size. Now this aircraft count was also impacted by the triple flight deck system as the full length of the ship was not being used for aviation storage, but hangar walls were further reducing this number, so aboard future Japanese carriers they would attempt to keep a consistent hangar wall for better aviation storage. Another issue with the aviation storage that was noted was aboard the Akagi, as upon completion Akagi's upper hangar was actually an open hangar. The issue the Japanese ran into was the humidity of the Pacific weather would tamper with the engines of the aircraft, and this made maintenance of the aircraft difficult, and often required the aircraft engines to be covered with some variation of canvas or tarp. For future aircraft carriers, the hangars would have to be fully closed to prevent the weather from tampering with the aircraft, and this in turn would help ease their maintenance. Upon completion, both Akagi and Kaga would mount six coaxial 10th year 12cm anti-aircraft guns. These weapons for their time were considered excellent, but the issue with the weapons was not their design, but their placement aboard the ship as being too low. During exercises with the ships, it became obvious that one side of anti-aircraft guns was incapable of defending the vessel without some sort of assistance. So, to help negate this problem, the Japanese decided that future ships should have their anti-aircraft guns mounted high enough to shoot across the flight deck so the full complement of AA could be utilized. This requirement would see itself negated by the strict enforcement of CAP operations, meaning that if aircraft were on the flight deck, it would be stupid to shoot across it, so rotation limiters were mounted on future aircraft carriers to prevent the guns from shooting across the flight deck anyway. Now, the 10th year 12cm gun itself had a replacement by 1929, and this was the Type 89 12.7cm dual-purpose gun, 
Akagi would never receive this weapon. It would keep its complement of six coaxial 10th year 12 centimeter guns. However, Kaga would receive the upgrade, and this meant it dropped all 12 centimeter guns in favor of the 12.7 centimeter gun. Of course, by the time of World War II, both weapons were dreadfully outdated. Moving from the anti-aircraft guns, let us now take a look at several integral issues with the ships, and this is the category that the reconstruction could not fully address, and these issues would plague the ships until they were lost at the Battle of Midway. The aviation fuel tanks were an integral part of the ship's hull, and this meant that upon being struck, there was a high chance that these tanks could rupture and cause extensive fires, or even worse, outright detonate. Due to Japanese carrier design doctrine, future designs would retain this integral issue, and there are many instances where one hit resulted in a Japanese carrier being lost because the aviation tanks and fuel lines were so vulnerable, being a part of the ship's structure. Another issue with Akagi and Kaga was their excessive height. Both hangars had to be stacked on top of the already existing battlecruiser and battleship hull, this is not an issue the Japanese could overcome, as they would have to completely redesign the hull of the ship if they wanted to incorporate the lower hangar into the hull, like future carrier designs. Even during reconstruction, both of the primary hangars would remain stacked on top of the already existing hull. The extreme height of the ships resulted in a few issues. They were extremely tall, this meant that they were easier to spot than the other carriers. They could not incorporate armor into the upper workings of the ship at the risk of the ship capsizing, and even without this additional armor, the stability of Akagi and Kaga was comparatively less to that of other Japanese carriers, and this meant that as an aviation platform, they were amongst the most unstable in the Japanese Navy. As we would see from Soryu and beyond, the upper hangar would be built on top of the hull, and it would hold the flight deck, while the lower hangar would be incorporated into the upper section of the hull, reducing all of the issues that I have just mentioned. Another integral issue had to do with the ship's damage control system. Both Akagi and Kaga, even following reconstruction, needed to have their electrical generators operating for their firefighting equipment to function. There was no manual backup. The issue here was obvious. In the event that the electrical dynamos were damaged or were unable to operate, the ships would be completely vulnerable to any fire, and this meant that future Japanese carrier designs would need to have some sort of a backup system. The final issue to discuss relates to the previous, meaning it deals with damage control, and this is the enclosed hangars of the ships. Now, while the Japanese were fully aware that enclosed hangars would cause issues when taking damage, and during the development of Shokaku they would attempt to address these, it had to be acknowledged that there was no real alternative to protecting the aircraft other than enclosing them from the external elements. So, in the event that these carriers were hit, their hangar walls would be blown out and their flight deck collapse in the area of the detonation, and if the Japanese are as lucky as they were at Midway, there would be several internal explosions, which would only hasten the destruction of the ship's upper workings. The ships structurally were sound in their upper workings until they were hit, and then the expanding gases would cause multiple beams to break away, cause the flight deck to detach in the immediate area, and cause several bulkheads to blow out. It was by far the greatest downside to the enclosed hangar system, but as far as the Japanese were concerned, the enclosed hangars were still the best option available to them. That is all of the design faults with Kagi and Kaga that I am going to list for today. Obviously, the ships were hindered by other issues, but these were comparatively minor to what I have gone over in this video. So, if you have learned something new, why not leave a like and a comment down below, and have a wonderful day. Thank you.